The Wall Street crash of 1929 led to the depression of the 30s. Central to Friedman's thesis was his opposition to the New Deal, announced by President Franklin Roosevelt in his inaugural speech. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Influenced by the economist John Maynard Keynes, Roosevelt started a program of public employment to get people back to work. Today, depression is a fading memory. Millions of men and women have found employment, and with it, confidence and hope. It wasn't that simple. The depression lasted into World War II. But after the war, the Marshall Plan spread Keynes's model of government regulation and intervention to Europe. His principles were widely accepted, but not in the economics department of the University of Chicago. Milton Friedman from this university waged a war against the New Deal. Friedman was a member of a group called the Mont Pelerin Society, led by the Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek. They believed that if governments stopped providing services and stopped regulating markets, the economy would correct itself. In the 50s, they were seen as cranks, but over the last 30 years, their ideas have become the dominant economic doctrine. The thesis of the shock doctrine is that we've been sold a fairy tale about how these radical policies have swept the globe. That they haven't swept the globe on the backs of freedom and democracy, but they have needed shocks, they have needed crises, they have needed states of emergencies. Milton Friedman understood the utility of crisis. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. It was in Chile that Friedman's disciples first learned how to exploit a large-scale shock or crisis. Usually the official storytellers of neoliberalism, the official publicists, don't even mention Chile. They start the story with Thatcher and Reagan because it's much more flattering that way. In the 50s and 60s, Chile's progressive developmental policies were a beacon in the region. The government invested in health, education and industry. American corporations were worried their investments would suffer. In response, the U.S. State Department began sponsoring students from Chile and the rest of South America to study free market economics with Milton Friedman. The University of Chicago had a joint arrangement with the Catholic University of Chile under which a great many Chilean students came to the University of Chicago, were trained by us and received PhDs. These students went back and taught in Chile. The Catholic University Economics Department in Santiago became a little Chicago school. Arnold Harberger, the economist in charge of the program, described himself as a seriously dedicated missionary. In 1970, Salvador Allende's popular unity government won the election on a platform of nationalization of large sectors of the economy. Chile's phone company was majority owned by the US corporation ITT. It spearheaded attempts to stop Allende becoming president. It had the support of Richard Nixon in the White House. I was not there, but I can uh, tell you what we now know to be a fact. He uh, ordered the CIA to, to prevent Allende from assuming the presidency. And indeed, they tried to get me to lean on the Chilean military right after Allende was elected. Despite the efforts of the CIA, Allende was sworn in as president. Richard Nixon ordered the CIA director to make the economy scream. Preparations began for the military coup. 
the Chilean Chicago boys started work on a 500-page economic blueprint called the BRIC. With US funding, everything was done to destabilize the economy. Truck drivers went on strike, bringing factories and shops to a standstill. There was a failed coup attempt on June the 29th, 1973. And then on September the 11th, with General Pinochet leading the army, the assault began on the presidential palace. Chile had enjoyed 41 years of uninterrupted peaceful democratic rule. Now it was being violently overthrown. Pinochet and his supporters described the coup as a war. It was certainly designed to look like one. It was a Chilean precursor to shock and awe. The Chicago boys delivered their economic blueprint, the brick, to Pinochet. <laughs> days that followed, more than 13,000 opponents were arrested and imprisoned. Thousands of prisoners were held in the national stadium. Many were tortured. Chile became notorious around the world. At the beginning of November, 5,000 prisoners were released. The 900 they left behind were transferred to other detention centers. Less than a month later, FIFA allowed Chile to play a World Cup qualifier in the very same stadium. Their opponents, the Soviet Union, refused to play there, so Chile were allowed to score into an open goal and went through to the 1974 World Cup Finals. With the population in shock, Pinochet imposed the policies recommended by the Chicago boys removal of price controls, the sale of state companies, the removal of import barriers and cuts to government expenditure. Friedman later openly acknowledged the importance of the Chilean experiment. Here was the first case in which you had a movement toward communism, which was replaced by a movement toward free markets. It didn't work. A year later, inflation was 375% per year, the highest in the world. 
So in March 1975, Arnold Harberger and Milton Friedman flew into Santiago. He used a phrase that had never before been used in a real-world economic crisis. He called for shock treatment. He said that he was like a doctor that was going to help a country that was suffering an epidemic, and he was simply prescribing the medicine. Friedman wrote that General Pinochet was sympathetically attracted to the idea of a shock treatment, but was clearly distressed at the temporary unemployment it might cause. It rapidly became clear that Friedman's economic policies benefited the wealthy at the expense of the poor. It was calculated that a family trying to live on the average wage had to spend 74% of its income on bread. Items such as bus fares or milk became luxuries, and Pinochet got rid of free milk in school, a move that echoed the controversial policy of the young education minister in Britain, who would later become his friend. In order to enforce these economic policies, there had to be an enemy to fear. Tampoco yo que se haya triunfado totalmente sobre el marxismo. El marxismo es como un fantasma. Cuesta mucho tomarlo. Mejor dicho, no se puede tomar. 